We can look at the world from our observation, from our own viewpoint, through our biases and everything else. But like for me, you know, we'd have a guy come over here to help fix the sprinklers. And do you shake hands or don't you? Like you start thinking about it. And then eventually you just kind of default to not doing it. And then it just starts to feel like normal again, but in a way that doesn't feel right. And that's kind of what's come up for me in the last two years. And it's been gradual. It's not like it happened overnight that all of a sudden everybody just stopped shaking hands or smiling. That's one thing. And then the second thing, too, is the fact that we're hearing a lot of politicians, and I don't want to tie in all the politics on this, although I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about it, but you know, hearing politicians that are speaking up, but they're actually doing it again from the uh, perspective of what they're experiencing. So they're saying their constituents are calling in and they'll make reference to like the mom that's saying that their kid won't eat because they're so anxiety filled from what they're dealing with at schools and the lack of interaction with their peers. There's seniors that are calling in and saying that they want to end their life because they're so lonely. They don't have people around them, including loved ones. And then the other reference was a man that called in who was a small business owner who was in tears because his business is collapsing in front of him. And I, although it's really sad to hear those things, I'm really encouraged to hear people talking about this out loud because it's at least bringing awareness to it. And the first thing that that came to mind there is how quickly, or sorry, how slowly things kind of got to where they were. And then now, how do we get back to a state of, wanting to interact and be social and hug and smile and high five and everything in between. There's a lot of interesting pieces in there. Like as a dad, and I know you're a dad too. The kids thing is the one thing that you mentioned that I've thought about a lot, right? So from a neuroscience perspective, kids' brains are still developing, right? And they don't have all the tools that you need to deal with things. So I'm really curious about the impact on the kids Because while my son's more tech savvy than I am, you know, at least it looks that way, but it's not the same as his direct interaction. And and he is socially isolated now. Like he does go to school and he wears his mask, but his actual friend time is really, really limited. And he definitely experienced paranoia. And again, it's uh, no reference point, right? Like they're new to the world. Even as, you know, even we look at them and they're 14 and 15, we think, oh, okay, that's pretty far along. Your brain's not finished developing then, right? Like your brain is, and especially the logical part of the brain, so that's the front part of your brain, what we call the prefrontal cortex, that's the last thing to finish off, right? And it's basically why kids make stupid decisions, because the logical part of their brain isn't there fully yet. (laughs) Yeah. And it's why girls actually mature a little bit earlier than boys, because the prefrontal cortex in girls tends to be a little bit more fully formed. And they have these emotional systems there. And, and the other one that was interesting is the elderly people. Because like I, I said earlier, our brains are hardwired to be social. And, you know, elderly people can be isolated at the best of times. And then you slap a pandemic on top of that, right? And it's in, in the data on this is really clear. Like if you look at elderly people that do have a lot of social interaction, these are the ones that are high function, high performing. They have lives, they get out, they do things. And the ones that tend to, you know, slip into Alzheimer's or dementia faster or end up killing themselves are the ones that are socially isolated. And that was without the pandemic. Like that was just the way it was pre-pandemic. So then you add the pandemic on top of it where you're pushing more of them or all of them in some cases into social isolation. We're just creating all those problems that we already knew that were were there, but we're just pushing more people there. And it's sad. Like my mom's in New Zealand. And I haven't seen her for two years and she doesn't have a lot of friends there anymore because she's 84 and, and, you know, a lot of them have passed. And she is, she's in tears most nights when I call her because she's just so fed up and she doesn't know what to do. And I think the only reason she's still, you know, keeping going is because she believes at some point her son and her grandson will make an appearance. (laughs) And it all makes sense in terms of the brain. Like it's just the way we're wired. I think part of it's just being aware of it too. Totally. Yeah. You know, not to feel bad because you're down. It's perfect. Like, you know, people that are up, you know, people that are depressed or a bit more sad during the pandemic, like, yes, you should be. Because if you were going to design a a system to create depression, COVID is what you would design. Like, you know, you take people away from their loved ones, create these impossible situations like yours where you can't go see your kids, but you're dying to go see your kids do their sports. 
and and that's the recipe for what you would do. Yeah, no, I, and I believe that just having conversations like this to even just bring awareness, even if it's just one or two little nuggets along the way that somebody picks up is a part of it. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed that clip and you want to watch the full unedited episode, go ahead and click over here. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe. It really does mean a lot to me. Thanks so much.